Thanks, everybody. Uh, this is one of my favorite crowds, so I really, really uh, am missing all of you and uh, hope we see each other in person uh, at some point soon. Am I coming through okay? Chris yeah. is breaking up a little on my end, so it's uh, clear in, in the back. Thanks. Um, I changed the uh, title of the talk a bit between uh, the time I sent the email in and I thought about it this week. Um, but there's a, an interesting issue that came up with uh, the title of, of this kind of talk that I gave in uh, Austria in the fall on Austrian public television, and I wanted to talk about the rise of the anti-democratic right, it, of which Austria has uh, one party in a governing coalition. Um, and and the, the public TV executives decided that this would not be good for them to have a broadcast about the rise of the anti-democratic right. So I took that as a sign that I was kind of moving in the right direction, even though I had to change the title of the talk. Uh, we finally settled on an interesting German question of who are the people. Um, so I want to talk about who are the people today and, and how that fits into this broader spectrum of populism and, and authoritarianism and threats to democracy. But I want to pick up a couple of the themes from the morning session, which I found very, very interesting. Um, first, the, the, at the very first presentation of the Wisconsin Project, someone, uh, and I don't know who in the audience asked this, but someone said, well, how do you define populism? And someone else remarked, well, there's probably going to be as many definitions as there are presentations today. I humbly submit that this is a problem uh, and that we really uh, should not continue to use a, a term that is not only fuzzy and hard to define, but more importantly, it sounds like something that's going to go away. And it sounds like something that is uh, uh, generally happening as much on the left as on the right. And I think that all of those things are not going to be helpful if we want to have an impact with our work. So. So much of the, the talk today is, is really aimed at how can we uh, join around a set of core concepts that can be defined and that will have an impact, not just in the field, as, as Frank pointed out, uh, there is a sort of an industrial level production of work on populism, both in the uh, mass media and in the academic world. Um, so, so I would like to uh, argue that we're not so much in a populist moment as we are in an anti-democratic and authoritarian moment, and that we should face that as scholars. It um, is something that we should uh, be prepared to discuss. And I, I particularly am in, interested in uh, Kathy's comments earlier about is populism the problem or is it a symptom? And I'm going to argue this morning that it's, it's a symptom of fundamental institutional breakdowns in democracy, in particular, uh, what Sherry was talking about in terms of parties. Uh, parties having been hollowed out, as Peter Mayer uh, called it some years ago, and are, are not just out of touch with the voters, but that the electoral and, and, and representational process has broken down. So there, there are a lot of studies, if you look at uh, Larry Bartell's recent work, uh, about representation across the democracies having gone up the income ladder so that depending on which country you're looking at, only the top 20 or 30 percent get real political representation. So I think we need to connect the structural conditions underlying the rise of whatever we want to call this thing. Um, and, and I also would like to uh, endorse Silvio's comments that it's it's really time, given this underlying institutional failure that has led to the rise of what I prefer to call radical right, uh, anti-democratic movements and parties, uh, that it's really time we reassess what our underlying assumptions about the democratic public sphere uh, look like in different countries. So that said, I'm going to disappear and, and uh, put some slides up to sort of talk through this, and then I'll come back, and I hope we'll have a, a lively discussion in which you will all convince me that populism really is the term we should be using here. Um, so let's see if I can get this to work. Um, 
And um, let's see if this. So how does this look? Is this yeah. happening? Okay, great. So uh, the idea here is communication in the crisis of democracy. Uh, and I should uh, acknowledge that a lot of the development of this uh, has occurred while I've been in Europe, thanks to my good colleagues Barbara Fetch and others at Free University Berlin and uh, uh, the time uh, that I needed to sort of pull some of these ideas together. Also, the collaborations that go into these thoughts uh, include a number of other people, um, Alexander Segerberg from Stockholm University, um, Kurt Knufer, who's coming back uh, to Barbara's group at, uh, in, in Berlin, uh, among others. So, so the point, and this is for my German-speaking friends in the audience, kind of a, a significant historical question. Um, and, and it seems to me that, that we are engaged in many societies, the U.S. included, but certainly not uh, exclusively, um, in, in fundamental questions about who are the people. And if, if we're really debating who are the people who are entitled to uh, rights in, in the state, um, we have a fundamental crisis of democracy uh, underlying these uh, so-called populist movements. So, so the question that I want to start with is why, why are we calling them populists? I know it's easy and, and I know that everybody nods their heads because I think everybody has a different definition in mind when they're nodding their head. Um, so it, even if we take uh, the, the uh, model offered by Reinemann and Frank Esser and, and Toril Alberg and others in, in that lovely article or chapter in, in the book on populism, and even if we expand the definition to include othering or the exclusion of whole categories of citizens from state rights, um, we, we do begin to get at the fundamental questions that Frank and, and Jörg were talking about around what is the discourse of, of these groups, um, restrictions on immigrants, refugees, but let's not stop there. We're also talking about limitations of rights for religious and sexual minorities. So these are kind of fundamental democratic questions that I would prefer to address in those terms rather than just wave them off as populism. So I guess I would quibble a bit with Frank and, and say that, you know, when we start talking about rights for religions and, and, and identity groups in society, um, that, that it's, it's beyond immigrants and it's beyond refugees, although I do agree that, that the immigrant and refugee crises have fueled a lot of these movements. So there are other developments, however, that I think, um, you know, even the, 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 the biggest definition of, of populism that we can imagine uh, doesn't quite point us toward, I think, for example, that many of these movements uh, are, are either censoring the press when they have gotten into government, uh, as has happened in, in Hungary and, and Poland, or are intimidating the press, as happens almost every day if you tune into the Twitter feed from our current president. There are also limitations on civil society organizations which are often the, the lifeblood of the, the, the of public sphere, uh, the, the, the society sphere in, in democracies. Many of these movements and groups have wealthy elites uh, either as leaders or as backers. So that seems to me to be a confusion of what populism is really about and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then uh, there is the formation of international networks going on, which I think is another interesting development. So it's not just a nationalism uh, kind of phenomenon. And many of these groups, including the Austrian Freedom Party, although it may have changed as it has gotten into government, uh, were beginning to move in the direction of ties with Russia, thinking that managed democracy or illiberal democracy looks like a pretty good way to go uh, in democratic terms. So I propose that we should really just call it what it looks like to me, which is the rise of radical movements and, and anti-democratic parties. So what's interesting is that you begin to, if you start looking at who appears with whom in many of these political moments, elections are a good example, um, you see kind of an interesting rotating cast of characters. This is Nigel Farage, Mr. Brexit, as he was billed in the German election uh, rally in Berlin this summer. So meet Mr. Brexit, who is uh, campaigning here for the alternative for Deutschland, which is now 
uh, if, if the government is actually formed in Germany, which I don't know because it's a kind of a critical question at the moment, uh, which is the, the largest opposition party, and they're pulling very close to the Social Democrats these days, again, to echo Sherry's point about how out of touch these parties have become as they become more or less extensions of the state rather than representatives of uh, groups of people. So here's Nigel again in the golden elevator in Trump Tower, um, and Nigel with Steve Bannon, who has now been ostracized from the administration, campaigning for this fellow who uh, narrowly lost uh, the Alabama Senate election despite having been uh, outed as a child molester. Uh, so Nigel gets around. But let's look more at the big picture here. I'm going to come back to the networks that link people like Nigel uh, and, and Brexit and the AFD and the FPU and so on. But, but let's look at, at, at the balance because I hear a lot of people saying, well, populism is happening all over the place, left, center, and right. And then you can find examples of it, I suppose, but it seems to me that if we look at the data on how these parties are actually doing in elections, um, we see a, a big imbalance. But I want to say that we so, and I know this is going to be painful for a lot of us, uh, need to change our definitions of what means left and right these days. So, for example, uh, Pip is going to be closing the conference. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be there for that. Um, Pippa wrote an early version of what I assume is the same paper that she'll be talking about today, in which she had some parties that are clearly on the radical right classified on the radical left populism uh, end of the spectrum because they were welfare parties. Well, all of that is beginning to change. As I said earlier, people are being excluded as entire classes of citizens. So many of the radical right parties in Europe today are offering welfare benefits for true citizens, welfare nationalism, it's come to be called. So, so I think we need to begin thinking about what does the radical right really mean today compared to uh, its older ideological definitions. There's also growing support for managed democracy or illiberal democracy among these groups, um, which is why I think we need to talk about the, the, the threat to democracy itself. So this is uh, some data that, that we gathered, Alexander Segerberg, Kurt Knupfer, and, and myself, on uh, how the re most recent elections have gone in Europe <coughs> using a... Uh, party classification system developed by the Chapel Hill Expert Survey and also confirmed in, in other places such as Wolfram Nordzik's uh, website. And, and I'm, we, to simplify what we, we can show, we're, we're only looking at countries with over 5 million population and parties that got over 5% of, of the vote. So if you look at radical right parties, and these are to the right of the Christian Democrats and the, the liberal parties. Um, what you see is that we've got um, 17 nations in Europe uh, with over 5 million population um, that have radical right parties in parliament and five of them are now uh, in government. Compare that to the left and you've got 9 and 1. So you've got 17 and 5 versus 9 and 1. And I'm not sure that, that many of these over here on the left side would, would easily classify as populist because you've got basically the former communist parties of Europe lining up over here or socialist uh, parties uh, such as Syriza and, and Podemos. And I have no idea what to do with the five-star party. It seems to change every time I look at their positions. So anybody uh, who would like to figure that one out, please let me know. Um, but I put it over here to be generous um, to their, uh, at least to their origins. So what's going on with the left? Why is the left not competing with the right? And it turns out, we looked at a, a lot of data on this, and it turns out that there are as many radical leftists as there are radical rightists. Uh, it turns out that the radical left is more dissatisfied with government and the economy than the radical right, in part because the right is actually getting into uh, parliament and into government more often. And the, the, the left participates in all forms of politics at much higher levels than uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, the, the left participates in all forms of politics at much higher levels than does the right, with the exception of voting. So this is uh, based on ESS survey data on voting over uh, the period from 2002 to the um, most recent one that we could uh, find comparable data for, 2014, on the, the left and on the right. Um, and that if you slice the data differently, what's kind of interesting as well is that in many of the countries that sort of have uh, had the, the highest resurgence of, of radical right movements and parties, uh, they have the lowest uh, voting rates on the radical left, even though leftists in these countries are active in all other forms of politics at much higher levels, such as protests, civil society memberships, and so on. Part of the issue on the on the left is that many leftists have been so discouraged by the institutional failures of the social democratic and labor parties that they have developed a, a counter political culture centered around diversity, inclusiveness, um, and deliberative democracy, which doesn't match up very well with political party organization and communication processes. So, so deliberative democracy is kind of the rage on the left, but it is, it is hell on political parties. Uh, and so there's a, sort of a mismatch, and there's a paper that I included in the packet on attempts to create deliberative parties and what the limits of those attempts have been. So what's the problem here? Um, I, I think going back to Sherry's comments um, it would, would be a good place to, to begin this discussion. There's been a hollowing of the center-left and of the center-right parties. I mean, the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats in Germany in this last election had the worst voting uh, polls uh, since the, the 1940 post-war period. So um, th there's also been a drop-off in electoral representation. Again, I recommend uh, Larry Bartels has a nice... Uh, overview of his recent work on an, on the SSRC website on a in a, a group that they've organized called Anxieties of Democracy. That was a kind of careful way to, to venture into this area of is democracy institutionally failing and therefore we have the rise of these anti-democratic movements. Um, but but because of these institutional failures, I think that you have large publics forming, and this was discussed in many different ways this morning, who no longer believe what party officials or public officials, uh, elected officials are saying, and therefore they no longer believe the press that's carrying the message of officials who are no longer regarded as legitimate. So I think we've got a a kind of a systemic dysfunction in how we conventionally as communication scholars and political scientists have conceived of the democratic public sphere. The idea is that elections are supposed to represent people, uh, elected officials therefore are legitimate, the press carries the messages of those officials back to the people who then process it and decide what to do next time they get to, to vote. Well, all of that I think is breaking down in many, many countries. So that brings us to the question of how did all this happen while we were kind of sleeping? Um, I want to talk about the rise of, of what has uh, become called, uh, not my term, but I like the term, weaponized information. Um, and I don't know if uh, Frank or Jörg or others, if, if, if my attempt to create a German term for this makes any sense at all, but if there's no Germanization of it. Um, so I'm going to talk quickly about three phases of what I see as systematic weaponized information with strategic political goals, aims of promoting radical right and anti-democratic politics. First of all, going back to the post-war period, we've got the rise of a global neoliberal idea system promoted by hundreds and hundreds of think tanks um, aimed at market deregulation, privatization, uh, and the, the, the minimal role of the state around basically protecting business interests, ownership, patents and property, and security. So that is the kind of the dream of, of, of the neoliberals, and it's, it's largely being realized, but I think with some repercussions that have led to the disruption of societies so that political parties and voters no longer know who each other are. 
So after the think tank wave uh, swept the world in the primarily starting in the 50s, but really in the 80s and 90s, then you get the rise of political media networks in the U.S. There are formal media, uh, Breitbart and uh, Daily Caller and Fox News, of course. In other countries like Austria and, and, and Germany, it's more social media, but nonetheless they are coordinated media networks that begin to create alternative information, which has been loosely called fake news, but I would prefer to call it their truth. So um, there are multiple truths now and, and large publics uh, competing over uh, those truths. And phase three is as the institutional um, body begins to decay, um, you end up having outside uh, influences coming in and further uh, adding to the corrosion, the, the decay of politics. Bots, trolls, outside hacking, Russian influence, and so on. So the result of this sort of systemic 40, 50 year old long period of, of information changes in the public sphere is we now have opposing public spheres that mix news and disinformation and on the right side uh, mobilize rather large publics in movements and elections. So here's my picture of phase one. Um, it really, the genius of the Mont Pelerin Society, which formed around Friedrich Hayek, and most of you know this story, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, and, and met at, at uh, the, the Swiss resort of Mont Pelerin in uh, 1947, and has been meeting ever since, by the way, it was in, in Stockholm uh, last year. But Hayek endorsed the idea of think tanks sort of second-hand retailers in ideas, he called them. And in, in, by the 80s, when Reagan and Thatcher came to power embodying uh, these ideas, there were 40 of these uh, federated Atlas Network think tanks. Here are some of them in the U.S. Uh, today, there are 500 of them in 80 different countries. And parts of the program um, of, of privatization and, and, and the diminished role of government and, and putting everything on a market basis in, in society, insofar as that's possible. Some elements of that program were, were communicated by very prominent public intellectuals. Ayn Rand should also be on, on this list. Uh, but Walter Lippmann resonated with some of this. So, so there were some very credible intellectuals that promoted aspects of neoliberal thought. Then, of course, there was a, a large collection of early adopter politicians and, and some later ones. There were enough business elites to fund the think tanks. Um, you know, and these, this uh, term in Toxies was an early one. Koch is a current one funding a number of, of these think tanks. And then there was an enormous amount of credibility around the neoliberal brand through economists that turned out to win a large number of Nobel Prizes during the 80s and the 90s. So the brand was enhanced through the credibility of these economists who were members of and fed ideas into uh, the think tank of the Mont Pelerin Society. So that's the core of phase one of the uh, distribution of ideas uh, in, in societies. Around this is a dense set of networks that echo these core ideas and carry them into to different aspects of our everyday lives and, and our lobbying and government and, and that. So, so this is a kind of how it all began. And so what do societies pretty much everywhere, the US and the UK have the heaviest doses of neoliberalism, but Germany, uh, Sweden, uh, and others have what I would call neoliberalism light. Um, but, but what do these societies look like after 40 years of privatization, market deregulation, and global trade? Nearly everywhere in the democracies, it seems to me, there's a double austerity. The austerity of government cuts and reduce public services, which affects people in a particular set of ways. And then there's the austerity of business that has extracted profits and created enormous inequalities in society while uh, pressuring workers with very little in the way of wage gains. 
The result of all that, it seems to me, is a huge amount of voter anger across the political spectrum, left and right, which we found in our ESS uh, data of, of uh, European countries. And it's increasingly hard to sell neoliberal policies using the slogans that worked so well in the 80s and 90s, from Ronald Reagan to Bill Clinton to Tony Blair to Schroeder in, in Germany, the idea that free markets will make free people. Well, people who are suffering under cutbacks, both public and private, uh, tend to feel a little less free uh, than they should. So the result is that the communication is, is becoming trickier. Politicians, parties don't know how to find voters, how to sell voters, the, 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 what Blumler and, and, and Kavanaugh called the, the sort of the third age of political communication is dead because marketing slogans no longer work. And so what I'm beginning to see in phase two is some unholy alliances between very far-right business elites, not the entire business community, because of course they are still benefiting from the neoliberal regimes. But there are some very far-right business elites that have ideological commitments to libertarianism and to, uh, to preventing democracies from uh, enabling collective organization whether that collective organization be unions or whether it be large movements turning into voting blocks that might favor uh, left parties uh, over right-wing parties. <clears throat> so many of these elites have discovered that even though they may not like the idea of the Tea Party or the AF Day or the FPU, that actually aligning themselves with those right-wing movements is the best defense they have for their own uh, power in government itself. So phase two communication here has been fueled by what I'm calling new information brokers. Um, the Koch brothers have become new information brokers in the U.S. Um, a lot has been written on, on the way in which the Kochs sort of took a very distributed grassroots movement called the Tea Party and turned it into a, a wing, a very disruptive wing of the Republican Party. <clears throat> the Cox have put money into right-wing websites like Daily Caller, uh, and they fund a number of think tanks um, um, as well. Here's another of the new information brokers, um, Robert Mercer, who was a backer of Trump, uh, who, who for a time owned a stake in Breitbart. Um, and, but more importantly, he's looking at the, uh, what Phil Howard is calling the computational propaganda process, which gets people well below the radar of, of media uh, sites themselves. And look at who's popping up again in this picture. So, so Nigel is once again uh, networking with, it turns out in this case, uh, Robert Mercer. And, and just a very tiny piece of this network, it would be a much more interesting and, and rich network, but, uh, um, but, but this is pretty good newspaper reporting by Ken Wallader from the, the Guardian. But you begin to see that Cambridge Analytica is promoting um, computational propaganda, it, both for Brexit and for the Trump campaign, and I'm guessing uh, for other clients that uh, we haven't learned about yet. So the, 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 the beginning of what looks to me to be a transnational data and misinformation driven right wing network, uh, I think is underway. And I, I think as, as scholars, we should study it. If, if it turns out that, that the network only looks like this, maybe we can uh, breathe a sigh of relief. My guess is we'll discover it looks a lot scarier than this. Uh, the trouble is we're not studying this stuff. Journalists are studying this stuff right now. Um, so what we've got now is, is a war in which everyone's pointing fingers saying, you know, the, you're the fake news, no, you're the fake news. Uh, and so we, we have kind of produced systemic confusion in the public sphere, and Silvio talked about that. Uh, earlier this morning, and, and I think that's something that we're all understandably concerned about. And the question, of course, is how do we sort it back out so that the public sphere actually serves a democratic purpose rather than undermining uh, democracies? So, so part of the 
connection between the phase one and the phase two in this long term information campaign is that information that comes out of think tanks for example think tanks funded by the Koch brothers denying climate change science begins to find its way into politicians like Donald Trump but you can find the same politicians in the UK or in Germany or or in Sweden and then they have to be reported in the mainstream media so so the the fake news and confusion process is is systemic in the sense that the press needs to cover the politicians who are now using the misinformation to favor business interests over public interest and then phase three once the Institute corrupted and 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 really dysfunctional you know it then then you get bots trolls foreign hackers and and others who really begin to prey upon the divisions that already exist in these democratic societies so I think that the the reason why hacking and trolls and bots weren't so big until lately is that the fundamental breakdowns of public spheres were not so great until lately so so the question that I want to kind of close with and then hear your comments and reactions is basically how is democracy doing these days well if you buy some of my characterization you'll you'll sense that yes we should go out and have a pub call and drown our sorrows but most of you are probably familiar with the work of Thoa and Monk looking at birth cohorts in world value studies over time and here's an interesting look at these are people born in the 1930s up through people born in the 1980s the Millennials in other words and how essential is it to live in a country called democracy well less and less essential all the time so the Millennials are in the US are saying that only 30% of them find it essential to live in a democracy and in Europe it's a little bit better but but not so much really still not even a majority and then here's one that's kind of a shocker is democracy a bad way or very bad way to run the country and the answer for almost a quarter of young Americans these days is yeah it's bad so here's my here's my interpretation of these somewhat shocking data is that if if you as a young citizen have grown up in a political system that never worked but is continuing to be called a democracy you might think democracy doesn't work and so you confuse the corruption of democracy with the very nature of democracy and I think that's where we are today that that for entire generations of citizens democracies have worked so poorly that they think it's a bad way to run a country and in a study I would like to do I think I have a hypothesis about how these young citizens are going to engage politically from this point forward I think that on the right they're going to join right-wing movements and parties and on the left they're going to go into a local political activism that is organized around diversity inclusiveness and deliberation and abandon political parties because they are perceived not to work and I can't tell you how many activists I've talked to both in the US and in Europe who really have given up back to Sherry's point earlier about the center-left parties who've totally given up on the Greens and the Social Democrats and who are trying to do politics outside of the electoral system which I think further enhances the leverage that the right uh, the anti-democratic right uh, has so to, to finish this uh, I guess I have some questions about what can academics and citizens uh, we are both academics and citizens and I I am gonna offer a, a humble um, encouragement for us to merge those roles because this problem is too important uh, to just academicize if you will so my first recommendation is we stop calling it populism it doesn't help everybody calls it populism everybody means something else and it I think diminishes 
the focus on where the real problems lie. I also think that we should really examine the institutional failures of democracy because I think that's where this problem is coming from and we should connect those institutional failures uh, with the, the, the nature of this uh, both political and communication problem that we're trying to grapple with. I would really like to see more of our research contextualized so that it includes changes in public spheres in different countries. Uh, I think there are huge disruptions in public spheres, the way in which institutions and, and information systems and publics all interact really don't work like the textbooks say they should, so we should rewrite the textbooks. And since we are in a position to do that, why not? And then finally, uh, as citizen scholars, I think we should develop normative perspectives on communication and democracy that actually begin to talk about why the left is failing, what it would take institutionally to bring the radical left back into the electoral process, and what it would take to bring the, the right back into the democratic process in ways that would be much more acceptable to them. And I think there are paths to all of these outcomes, but um, if we're just studying the surface phenomenon and maybe calling it by kind of a confusing name, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get to uh, those kinds of remedies. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much for your attention and for sacrificing most of your lunches, I'm guessing. Um, and I'm eager to hear your reactions. So am I back on the screen or? Not yet. Not yet. We've still got your slides. Okay. Turn off, turn off share screen. There you go. Okay, great. You're back. Hey, everybody. Thanks. I'll help to moderate the uh, questions a little bit, if that's okay, because I'm not sure you can see the room that well. So Good. questions? Devon? So a uh, uh, great talk, Lance. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, a couple of things that you said that really struck a, a chord of me. You had this one slide where you're talking about showing all this media self-coverage of right-wing critiques of the media. And all this meta coverage to me seems to be part of the problem. Part of, I don't know how many headlines I've seen where Trump critiques the media for bias without any context, you know, and, and this constant kind of never actually saying back, no, our coverage isn't biased, but instead kind of dutifully reporting in this quasi-objective manner, yeah. it's actually eroding trust in media. So I'd love for you to comment on sure. that. And then one other thought I had is, um, you know, I'm reminded of by what you said when you're talking about how young people have a very different understanding of democracy than we might because of their experience of democracy. I'm reminded of both Kirsten Thorson and Stephanie Edgerly's work where Kirsten was looking at what does civic engagement and participation mean, and Stephanie was what does news mean to young people. And what they found when they spoke to young people was their understandings of those two things were completely different than our academic understanding. And I think the same project could be extended to democracy, especially for uh, uh, the millennial generation. So I'd love your thoughts on both those. I think those are really great questions. It, in, in a way, the, the breakdown of the institutional order that, that offered publics hewing and legitimate information um, we all know the story there. If, if, you, if you sort of chart um, the institutional decline of representation, of credibility of parties, uh, you also find uh, Tim Cook's work uh, years ago uh, tracked on this, that the decline of the press has followed the same trajectory. So, so what you're saying about the press covering Trump's every tweet um, is true, I think. It may even magnify that decline, but I don't think it's the prime mover in the decline. I think it's the loss of institutional legitimacy and then the loss of legitimacy on the part of the press carrying the messages from institutions that are no longer trusted. So, uh, but, but the press, now that we've got this divided public sphere, um, the, I mean, the same thing happened in Germany with the rise of the IFD. There was the same debate in Germany, it's like we can't cover them. Well, how can you not cover them? They're now the largest opposition party in, in, in the Bundestag, uh, assuming the government is, 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 uh, holds up. I, I don't know if it will. but so, so how can you not cover them? How can you not cover the President of the United States? I mean, I, 
this is the, what I'm talking about in terms of how we need to recontextualize our research to account for public spheres that don't work the way they're supposed to in the textbooks. So I, I think that, that that question should lead you to write an article on that problem, but really contextualize in terms of public sphere breakdowns. Um, because the press can't stop covering Trump. The press can't stop covering the AfD in Germany. It, it just can't happen. Um, so, so the second question is really fascinating as well, and, and it really echoes that, that first point about what, what is the public sphere these days. Um, it's pretty much anything goes. I mean, so, so there is no clear line other than in our minds as academics, which is, I think, part of the problem that we face. But there is no clear line between news, um, fake information, uh, you know, made up stories, uh, propaganda, hate speech, all of that is sort of useful information for selective publics. So this is back to Silvio and, and some of the other points made earlier about what is truth today. Well, you know, you, we think that truth is evidence driven and it's logical, and but for many people it's entirely emotional. It's It may be driven by causes such as um, distress over the, the loss of public benefits or, or stagnation in wages, uh, but then it becomes directed at people uh, in, in Arlie Hochschild's wonderful uh, account of, of her uh, year in a Louisiana community. It's driven by politicians encouraging voters to think that the real anger is because people are cutting in line ahead of you for the welfare benefits. I mean, I was in Sweden in 2010 uh, when the Sweden Democrats shocked the entire country. I remember all of my academic colleagues uh, were in a deep political hangover the next morning after the Sweden Democrats got into parliament. And, and I remember vividly the commercial that probably got them in. It was banned from Swedish TV, it turns out. The, the, the Swedish uh, political campaign laws would not allow uh, exclusionary uh, political advertising on television, but it turns out that YouTube produced an audience far larger than any Swedish TV channel would have produced for a commercial that showed a silver-haired Swedish grandma, a little Oma, pushing her walker toward a one uh, handle hanging down that said welfare benefits. And out of the darkness, this is a very dark image, out of the darkness came a swarm of burqa-wearing immigrants <coughs> pushing the grandma out of the way and pulling the handle and receiving the benefits. And But, but this story is going around the world. This is the story of Arlie Hochschild's Louisiana um, community members who see immigrants as the uh, target of their anger. So, so, so anything applies today as information, which gets back to the point about the reason it's confusing us is because I think we're still holding an idealized version of the public sphere as our interpretive framework. And if we would just allow ourselves to give that up, I think we would see things very differently and uh, we would change our categories and our research. Hi, Lance. Hey, Lou. Uh, thank you for that, for that wonderful, terrible talk. Um, <laughs> it was the best, worst talk I've heard in a long time. <laughs> um, See, that's why populism is such an easier way to talk about all this. <laughs> um, I had a conversation with you about it, but I can't. Uh, this is public time. So I want to go back to the uncivic culture. Your left-right divide in voting, I think, is, was striking. And of course, that's magnified among young people specifically. So the withdrawal of young people, not only from voting, but from the institutional party system more generally, seems to be the crux of, I don't want to say the problem, but the gap between support for left, social democratic, or more radical policies and the success of right-wing parties across the world right now. So I guess what I want to do is, and I really was thinking of the uncivic culture, how would you connect your knowledge of that through connective action, et cetera, to this withdrawal from voting? How do we just simply avoid 
articulating this as a paradox, well, then people withdraw, so therefore they don't vote, and etc. Mm. What steps, if any, given the actual culture that leads to withdrawal, might actually lead young people to vote again? Well, I, I, I mean, I do see to, to try and mitigate the depressing nature of all this, I, I do see some, some promise, I mean, it, it, not just the Obama hope of, of some years ago, but I see the Jeremy Corbyn hope, uh, the Bernie Sanders. The trouble that I see in both of those cases, however, is back to this idea that parties have become hollowed out. They've become basically extensions of the state rather than civil society organizations. And, and when that happens, when you become basically a client of the state as opposed to a representative body of, of your voters, um, what happens is that, that on the left in particular, the progressive left, um, what you've got is a disconnection from electoral politics and a complete engagement with local community activism. And it's, it is striking. I, th this talk show I mentioned in, in Vienna uh, in the fall, one of the panelists was one of the uh, leaders of, of Attack in Austria, and Attack has been a long uh, neoliberal critique, uh, anti-globalization uh, protest organization. And, and I, I had a long conversation with her uh, in the green room before this, this show, and I said, what are you doing with the Greens or the, the Social Democrats uh, with your organization? Because they have a very large movement network, and she said they're completely hopeless We've tried so many times to, to engage them, um, and we are simply not interested anymore. We're going to do our own work helping refugees and immigrants, uh, helping people with health care problems and, and other issues in society. Um, but, but so here we've created, uh, to your point, Lou, a kind of a parallel public space on the left. Meanwhile, the right has has organized around a, a, a simple set of emotional messages, immigrants, of course, um, nationalism, anti-globalism, anti-EU uh, sentiments, but, but also attacks on the press. I, mean, I, I think we don't want to just stop there. I think we want to look at the press, back to Devon's question, and see what happens as these developments go the next steps and see what happened to the press in Austria, I mean in, in, in Poland, see what happens to the press in Hungary. And, and my own experience in Austria suggested that the public broadcasters were very much afraid that that's going to happen to them. Uh, and we'll see if that's true when the FPU uh, starts acting as, a, as a, a part of the government. Lance, you're also talking about an alternative civil sphere, right? I mean, essentially that's what you're describing, a rich, dense, alternative civil sphere that's completely yeah. disconnected from the parties as civil institutions. And, yep. and we can, of course, we can point to the role of the parties in, 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 in creating that disconnection, but, but we, it's almost as if we have parallel civil spheres at this point. I think it's both. I, I think there is, especially on the left, a parallel civil sphere. But I also think that the um, more hopeful cases of Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn illustrate the problem with parties. So that it is possible to bring young voters into the election process, but the very parties that, that these people were running for didn't like it, right? So, so Corbyn has, if Corbyn depended on the vote of sitting members of his own party in parliament, he would no longer be the party leader. Um, in fact, they, they voted no confidence, and it was only because his youth movement uh, had voting rights in the party that he was able to remain on as party leader. And, and you all in the U.S. context know the story of Bernie Sanders and his, uh, let's just say, lack of a warm welcome by the Democratic Party establishment. Hey, Talia, nice to see you. Where are you? I'm, I'm hiding on the <laughs> other side of the screen. So. Okay, sorry I can't see you, but... Uh... That's okay. Um, so I would agree with what Lou said. Thank you for the uh, best, worst talk I've heard in a while. And I'm hoping that you might offer us some uh, speculations or thoughts on where we go from here. 
So if we were thinking of our role as academics as not only studying and documenting the problems facing the public sphere or new public or civil sphere, but also uh, making a difference and thinking about how to push this forward, what uh, suggestions would you have for that sort of a trajectory? Yeah, I thanks. I, I'm constantly thinking about that question, and, and I realize that the answer is not going to probably be very popular, um, because it starts with not calling it populism and looking at, at the hard reality that this is right-wing anti-democratic uh, developments. Um, and I, I say that knowing that populism is a is an industry in in our field. Um, you know, you, you can you know right now there's a big demand for more work on populism, and and we are cheerfully supplying that demand. Um, but I I really think that we're missing the the really important issues with this approach. So so I think one thing we could do is begin looking carefully at how we're defining these terms and then if, if it begins to spill into restrictions on the press, restrictions on rights for entire categories of citizens, which is happening and, or is and proposed uh, by some of these parties that aren't yet in government, um, that, that really we need to look at it for what it is and I think that we will actually have more impact as a profession if we do that. I, I think that populism, I mean, the press talks about populism. Um, the theme for the Mont Pelerin Society meeting in Stockholm uh, last year or two years ago was what do we do about populism? Uh, populism was a big theme at uh, the World Economic Forum in Davos this winter. So, so everybody talks about populism, um, but nobody is really talking about, you know, how do we save democracy? Um, and, and I think that that's a more important question than what do we do about populism? So, so let's focus on how, how can we as scholars at least illuminate the problem so that the, the, the focus is on what's happening with democracy. And then as citizens, I, I think that we need to become activists as well. Um, I, I mean, you know, the University of Wisconsin is under attack um, by a Koch brothers apparatchik um, and, and, and his crew in the, in the legislature. And, and you know, it, 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 you have to fight back. Um, and, and since they suspended some of the normal rules of academic freedom, I, I think it's, it's our business to become advocates for democracy. And I, I don't think we should run from that. Um, if, if we begin to be afraid to advocate for democracy and in, in, in kinds of democracy that we can define very clearly, then I think that, that we're not doing our job as, as citizen scholars. Daniel, great time. I think we have time. Hey, Lance. Uh, hey, Daniel, nice to see you. Yeah, you too. Um, I want to take up uh, sort of your point that like, we write the textbook. Because um, I think it's an interesting sort of positionality for all of us in this room. And sort of also point out, though, that there's sort of a great irony within our field in particular is that we were awash in leftist critiques of the press until relatively recently when all of a sudden the right picked up the theme and we said, oh, we need the press as an institution. <laughs> We were awash in sort of normative theory <coughs> celebrating Occupy Wall Street and non-institutional politics until very recently when we were like, oh, our parties are being hollowed out and, and the youth today are pursuing right lifestyle politics, single issue politics that once had been celebrated now is all of a sudden a problem. And I guess what I worry about in the context of some of your comments, but it's also sort of something Silvio said earlier, it's that right, where are the boundaries around how we think about all this normatively, right? Sort of what's the role of institutions, political institutions and representation versus civil society? How do we talk to students about setting things like expectations and norms that we have to compromise in party systems? One of the great points that I think Nancy Rosenblum points out, and on the side of angels, is that civil society organizations are extremist. They're single issue, right? It's, it's their way or nothing else. And parties are about compromise. Um, right. And I think these are all fundamental tensions that we need to work through. Otherwise, what I sort of I, what I worry about is like we sort of <coughs> correct because we don't always have our normative sort of bases sort of worked out to think about a language to talk about this stuff. 
Um, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, there, there are several questions in, in that uh, comment uh, of yours. Uh, what do we tell students? Wow, that's a really big one. Um, what I tell students is that I'm not ashamed of, of defining and defending democracy and, and, uh, and, and offering a robust definition of democracy that includes rights and equality for all. Um, because I think we're losing that because it's been, it, it's been attacked and we've been attacked as the liberals who are you know, talking about extremism. I mean, for crying out loud, Barack Obama was condemned as a communist and a fascist by these groups and taken you know, literally in, in those terms. So, so I think that, that it, it's part of our obligation to actually uh, stake claims to really historically and culturally rich <coughs> definition of democracy and, and not uh, run from defending them and pointing out when they're under attack. <clears throat> but I'm also very careful to note that, that Donald Trump is not my problem. Uh, I mean, he's a pain in the ass, but he's, he's not the problem. He's, he's a symptom of the problem. And so, so when, when I put it that way, students are at least willing to, to think that I'm not just bashing Trump, but that I'm looking at, at some deeper issues with, with democracy. So I, but in your, your question about issues in civil society organizations, really interesting. It's fascinating to, to echo a couple of the themes from the talk. One thing I've noticed is that as government does less and less for society under the, you know, whatever version of neoliberalism you may be living with, um, what's, what results is you create more and more problems, right? So, so there's been a proliferation of problems because government has retreated from, from <laughs> those problems. What we end up with is this festival of, of engagement on the left, on the progressive wing, uh, trying to deal with these problems without the capacity to do so, right? So you've got food, you know, food and hunger problems, you've got homelessness problems, you've got you know, rights problems for a whole spectrum of, of, of citizen categories, and everybody is struggling with the problems that have been produced by this governing regime and um, not really winning. I mean, I, I talk to environmentalists all the time, you know, and, and try and convince them that if they would actually get behind economic reform principles and push the Democratic Party to shift away from neoliberal economics and, and governance and um, really develop an agenda that together with unions and other you know, former constituents of the Democratic Party, same argument could be made about Social Democrats or Greens in, in most European countries, that what might happen is that we begin to hear an alternative. I mean, you know, if you think about where neoliberalism came from, it came from the collapse of Keynesianism in the 70s, right? And, and, and the Mont Pelerin societies were waiting for this moment with all of the think tanks and the production of ideas <coughs> and the recruitment of politicians to sell those ideas, and they, they were very successful. The left has nothing like that going today, nothing like that going because most of the leftists I have talked to and interviewed are engaged up to their necks in really desperate problem solving, which they, which they can't handle, right? So, but instead of figuring out how to reinvent political parties and join in movements that are more solidary around common causes, like a new economy model, they're still fighting these global battles. So I, I see what you're saying as a, as a hugely important piece of all this. Um, so my, my contribution as a, as a citizen scholar is, is trying to figure out simple systems models that might join different progressive uh, organizations together that are currently isolated because of their intense focus on particular issues. We have time for one more question. I'll take one more if we only have, we always have the condition of one question turns into three. Um, I was really, uh, uh, this question of whether we should be calling it populism or, uh, uh, you know, the label you were advancing um, reminds me of the early debates over research on social capital, right, where 
the mm -hmm. field kind of coalesced around focusing on social capital and the process, I think, missed paying attention to polarization, to clients and trust. We've become so obsessed with the central concept that the concept essentially overwhelmed our attention to other aspects of a broader phenomenon. Mm -hmm. and Interesting. I, and I think the same thing is happening potentially with populism. As an organizing term, one of the things we're seeing repeatedly is political asymmetry. Things are very different on the right than the left. We don't mm -hmm. want to call that out so explicitly, but I think what you're advocating is to be more explicit about saying we're seeing a different pattern on the right than the left. We need to be explicit about that and we need to really address that the problem is more on the right than the left. Not to say that the, the right. left is blameless, mm -hmm. but that there's the, 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 the symptom that we're noticing is growing out of uh, uh, work that's being done more forcefully on the right in terms of the political machinery, in terms of the mm -hmm. think tanks and the establishments behind it. And I don't think we talk about that enough. Well, thank you. That, that was kind of a nice capsule of my entire talk. <laughs> so, all I can say is yes. Uh, Yay. And, <laughs> but I, I, I also like your point about how we were thinking about civil society, you know, when Putnam became the rage and we all bought into that in, in various ways, I think. Um, one of the things that, that concerned me especially in retrospect, as I've thought about it much more in, in recent years, is that the, 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 the breakdown of civil society, it, you know, wasn't due to television. I mean, Bob finally pulled back on that one. wasn't due to, um, you know, busier lives, although that's part of the story. Um, it, it was really due to the systematic attack on civil society by government itself, right? The, the funding for programs, the, the withdrawal of support for groups, and then you see that attack on civil society moving ahead in Hungary today with the, 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 the huge, um, uh, you know, pushback against George Soros and other civil society, Soros is in the headlines in, in the Hungarian case, but, but other civil society organizations as well. You see the attack on civil society even more extreme in Russia, um, and so so and, and the, the the affinity among these right wing parties and the Russian model or the illiberal democracy model in Hungary, I think is is something that we need to begin tracking. So I, I think that the breakdown of civil society has has um, much stronger origins in government uh, and, and and economics than than earlier thinking uh, really led us to, to believe. So how to strengthen civil society? Again, I, I mean, I hate to keep sounding like a, I, I'm trying to revive the classic model of the democratic public sphere, but it, it, it compared to the alternatives I'm seeing happening, I, I think we need to figure out how to revive parties and how to, how to make movements more in touch with in, in terms of pressuring parties to shift their economic uh, and government philosophies. Thank you, Lance. Lance, thank you and I think talk. we can do that, but it's very hard to convince movement activists who are consumed.